All right, folks. And with that, I want to welcome Nicole Sauce to the Survival Podcast. Welcome back, Nicole. Hey, Jack. How's it going? Pretty good, man. Pretty good. Hey, I want to start out with, I think 99% of my audience knows who you are, but probably a few people don't. There might be somebody who today's their first show. So who and what is a Nicole Sauce? Uh, Nicole Sauce is a particular, she's like your little sister who bugs you and bugs you and bugs you until you get stuff done, right? That's who I am. Um, I crashed the scene in, in TSP after spending about 14 years working in libertarian public policy, fighting the good fight and losing my ass. So I was really frustrated with that whole situation. I used to think you could work in the political system to change a broken system. And I just came to the realization that that's never going to work. And using a broken system to fix a system just ends up in layers of the onion. So there I had like built my whole career uh, on, based on this concept that I could make a huge difference and didn't and had dedicated 14 long, hard years making sacrifices to increasing freedom in our country. And all I was seeing happen was we were stepping back and I realized you need to live your own life. At that point, I had been on my homestead for about a decade and had transitioned from being reliant on the grocery store and the cities and all of those things and into a seasonal eating, getting things off of my land as much as possible and locally and into this more, I choose freedom for myself, fuck everybody else, and I'm going to live the way I want. So I launched a podcast and then after about a year, I met you at your spring workshop, that that first spring workshop where we had the electric fence hooked up, got to know, <laughs> got to know people there and gave a presentation on coffee because I was starting a craft coffee business and I stood in front of about 80 people at Jack's and, and, and declared that I would not grow this business. And as the words came out of my mouth, I realized I was lying to 80 people. And so I launched Holler Roast that year with Jack's help and with a lot of help from this audience. So that's kind of who or what I am. That doesn't go back to the origins of my communist orig origins teaching in public schools, but that's a different episode completely. So we won't go there. Cool. Well, I, you know, usually I do my quote of the day before I bring a guest on and or you, know, you you kind of taken over doing the program directing for Unloose the Goose, and you put the quote at the end. Yeah, I want to do the quote at the beginning, yeah. but with my guest today, and it's from our thumbnail. And since we're going to be talking about food preservation, this is by Virginia Wolf, and I'm going to confess that I first heard this quote um, on Big Bang Theory from Raj on Big Bang Theory. But I thought it was a really cool quote, and it was, "One cannot think well, love well, sleep well, if one has not." dined well what do you think of that nicole well, that's a hundred percent true and i i would say the way i became aware of how important food is to your body was by traveling to germany in the early 2000s and i would get up and walk around and do whatever you do when you're touristing in europe and i'd hit the market i'd buy whatever was fresh go home and cook it and by the end of one week, I had lost 15 pounds one week. And you know that wasn't actual fat that I lost. You know that was inflammation. And then I, I, I didn't have any gas or digestive issues like I used to have. And I came home to America and one meal in, just off grocery store food, I was sicker than a dog. And I realized I had brain fog. I had bloating. I had all of these things. That's actually where I started growing my own food because I realized I even the high-end organic stuff from uh, Four Seasons that I got in Portland, Oregon, grass-fed meats, all of that, not good. Not good. Yeah. I, I mean, we have to look at, I guess, is that full food is our fuel. I think that's yeah. kind of what she's saying. She's also saying like the quality and enjoying of it. But if you do think about like the food people are eating in America, uh, even might be labeled to seem better, but necessarily isn't. But if you look at the average food that the American average person oh, eats, yeah. it's horrible. Yeah. I mean, the additives, the preservatives, the, the processing levels, et cetera. Like, and so 
liken that to you go down to the gas station and you get your, you know, your good old unleaded gas, but on the way putting it into your car, you chuck some salt and some sand and some sugar in your gas. Like, you know, if you put enough of it, your car will die, but a little bit of your car is going to run like crap. And so I think there's a lot to preserving food, right? There's a lot to cooking food well, but we also have to start out with great food to begin with, or we can't do that. It won't matter. Like I, if I try to cook this tin can I'm holding up on our, on our live feed, no matter what I do, it's going to taste like crap because it's not food. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of food in our food supply is also not food. It's edible, but that doesn't make it food, right? And that's, that's, well, that's why you and I both do so much of our own production or we source food from yeah. not – somebody said that somebody said that somebody said that somebody said that the cow was organic. Like there's the cow, put a bolt in his head, and I'll buy the cow. Like that's, that's how we tend to get a lot of our food. Or we, we go through really ethical sourcers – that like, you know, one of my sponsors, Butcher Box, that you know the sourcing methodology, know you're actually getting what they say you're getting because buying organically grown grass-fed beef doesn't matter if the cow actually wasn't like grass-fed, right? right? Or was poorly managed because I've had some, I don't know about you, I've had some grass-fed beef, it sucks. And it was grass-fed, it was just the guy managing the cows didn't know what he was doing. So the cow was eating poor quality grass, so you have yep. poor quality cow. Poor quality cow. Yeah, I buy a cow every year and cool. So farmer, let's get into go ahead. Yeah, sorry. I think we have a little bit of a delay still, Jack. Um, I buy meat every year from the same farmer, <laughs> buy a whole cow, and it's fantastic. And last week I had one of those steaks, and then on Friday I had some steaks that Tactical Redneck bought from Publix, organic, grass fed, high end, and it tasted like dog food. Like we were eating the steak and I said, does this taste different than, than what we had two days ago? And he said, yeah, it's not very good. And that's, that's supposed to be the good quality stuff. So that's, it's, it's kind of funny. I did hear, and this is rumor, but I heard that um, some farmers in Tennessee that are framing things as grass fed to restaurants are buying cows on auction that may have been great and finished, bringing them home for a week and then processing them as pasture raised. Yeah, we're getting we're getting some serious delay and skip on you there, Nicole. Yeah. Do you want me yeah. to log out? Now then? you're back. Right. Okay. I'm sorry. No, no, we'll just we'll just power through and see if if we can avoid that since we're live. But uh yeah. I mean what I'm hearing you say is we have people like going down to sale barn, they're buying cattle, then they put them on their farm and grass fed them for like a week, and then they they're sending them out for processing and selling steaks to restaurants and all and calling it grass fed, right? What yeah. the the damage of the grain feeding has already been done. To me, you know, if a, if a cow breaks loose from the herd and gets into the barn and eats a little bit of corn, it'd be better if it didn't happen, but it's no big deal. But if that animal's actually fed and fattened on grain, I don't think that could ever be undone. Like that's, you've done it now. It's happened. It's, it's not, I don't know. Maybe if you put it back on pasture for like a few months, maybe, I don't know. I just don't think you can ever really fix that from a standpoint of ethical marketing. Right. It's, it's not good, but I, but I wanted, I, I wanted to dig into the, what we've got you on to talk about today, uh, which is food preservation. So what made you reach out to me and say, Hey Jack, let, let's, let me get on here and let's talk about pr preserving our food. Well, well, way back when I first started listening to the survival podcast, I, I was always impressed with how you just rattle off recipes for biltong or any different ways that you preserve food. And I noticed that in the, the last year, those topics haven't come up as much. So we've talked about some fermentation and I know that your show has grown by about a hundred thousand listeners. And I thought, you know what, there are people who may not have heard the back episodes on how to preserve food who are looking, who have listened to Jack grown their food and now they're like, okay, now I got piles of apples. What do I do with my piles of apples? So I thought, well, let's just go back to the basics and talk about that. And then when you pair that with the rolling shortage problem we have, where this is out of stock or that is out of stock, when you flow into a lifestyle of, of preserving in abundance, those things matter a lot less. Awesome. So apparently, Nicole, and I don't know how this will handle on the um, 
on the recording, but even though you and I have delays from each other, um, they're seeing and hearing it just fine on YouTube. So, okay. so that's good. So that we'll, we'll worry less anyway. Um, he, they, they, Tom's saying that you, there's no skipping, but we can see the delay between us. So I'll try to edit out some of the delay, but if you're hearing delay on the audio guys, it is what it is. Um, what do you think a person should do to get started in food uh, preservation? Um, kind of the first steps. I did do a lot of shows early on on it. And, you know, you cover so many topics. You start worrying about repeating content. And you realize, well, oh, yeah, it's not really, is it really repeating if the last time I did it was two years ago? So let's, let's be pretty basic. And where do we start out at? I, I think the first place to start is to learn how to cook. And a lot of people are very used to taking a package and following the directions on it, but they may not know how to take a wonderful cut of meat and throw it on a pan for about three or four minutes aside after seasoning it and, and have a really nice steak, right? So start cooking things from scratch and start with the basics, things you like to eat like breakfast or a steak for dinner, and then move beyond that to, if you're a bread eater, how do I bake bread from scratch? Okay, now how do I make mayonnaise? That's a little bit harder of a thing. And, and get to know what you and your family like. Because if you start preserving a bunch of stuff, like one year I had the biggest crop of radishes a person could ever have. I like radishes on my salad. You can pickle radishes, you can make radish relish, you can do all these things. And so I made all those things. And I didn't like any of them. So get to know what you like, get to know what your family likes and start planning what you would want to have on hand so that when you decide to learn things that you can do it and then just start, start with something, get, get cucumbers in June and make pickles. Or if you have a lot of tomatoes coming off your garden, learn, jump into a YouTube video series and learn how to can tomatoes and then eat those canned tomatoes and see if you like how they taste. I think the biggest hesitation people have to getting started in food preservation is just doing it. And then once they spend all this time preserving it, they put it on a shelf and don't use it. And that's like a huge waste of your time and money if you don't actually use the things that you put into jars. But start with cooking, learn what you want to preserve or what you'll want to have on hand, and then jump in because life ain't getting any longer right now. Yeah, absolutely. And I also think like people do kind of do the whole put it on the shelf and never use it. And I think part of why people do that is oh, I've preserved that, <laughs> right? So like now if I use it, it's gone. Well, that is the idea because then you should kind of get into a rhythm and be doing this every year. Like, so my grandmother, for instance, on my dad's side, she pickled, you know, tons of cucumbers every summer from the garden. She made huge amounts of chow chow, which is kind of like a, a hunky relish, you know, at the end of every garden season when there was surplus of everything. Um, she made all kinds of like jellies and jams and she made something she called barbecue sauce, which after, you know, moving to Texas way back in 1993, it was like, that's not barbecue sauce, but it was good. It was basically um, mamwich is what it really was. Yeah, right. Yeah. But she made all this stuff. But then like it's literally as soon as it was done and it was all stacked in the cellar, Fall came and we started pulling from the shelf and using it. We didn't really eat a lot of pickles in the summer when we had fresh cucumbers, right? Or we we didn't necessarily eat a lot of chow chow when we could go down and cut a bucket of broccoli every other day from the garden. But once that season ended, we started using the things that were stored. And by early spring, you wanted to get the garden in because most of it, if not all of it, was gone. And so it really was this eat what you store and store what you eat. It was just eat what you store, produce what you store, and then, you know, store what you eat. So, like, we we're just adding that additional step. And I think when people start thinking about it, like, they think about it the same way they do, like, you go to Mountain House or Providing Pantry or whatever, and you buy these tins, and inside that tin is, like, freeze-dried pork chops, hermetically sealed the way the United States government would in a bomb shelter, and literally 20 years later, you can open that up and eat that. It tastes good, right? Well, the food you're producing is not that. Right. So you probably should be using it. And if you don't use it, then you're going to wish you did. You're, you're going to feed it to your livestock 
if you don't use it. And it's really it's it's kind of sad to use your Aunt Helen's pickled beets and be out of them halfway through the winter. But it's more sad three years from now to be feeding Aunt Helen's pickled beets to your pigs or to your lot to to whoever or throwing it away because they've turned gray in color and don't taste good anymore. That's that's why you use what you preserve. And and it does get you, I think, into a better link nutritionally with with what's in your environment to to have that freshly produced food and then preserve it and then access that rather than stuff at the store that's been shipped for however long it's been shipped before it gets there. So let's dig into some of the individual methods of storing foods, drying, freezing, root cellaring, et cetera. Can we kind of just start ticking those boxes off? Sure. Uh, you know, the easiest place for most people to start when they start preserving food is with their freezer. And, and that's just, you know, learning which vegetables need to be blanched and which ones don't. Freezing them and putting them in the freezer. I, I like to do this in a way that they don't end up in a giant frozen clump. So I'll usually take a cookie sheet. If I'm doing green beans, you blanch them because if you don't blanch them, they turn into green bean cardboard. And what the blanching is doing is breaking down some of the enzymes on the skin. And then I'll put them, dry them with a towel or a paper towel, put them on a cookie sheet, put them in the freezer, come back a couple hours later, and then they're individually frozen and not sticking together so much. And then I'll put them in a Ziploc bag or a vacuum pack bag, label it, and put it in the freezer. The trick here, especially if you have a chest freezer, is you want to know what's in your freezer. So I like to have sections of my freezers. I have boxes in my chest freezer where the whole box will be beef or the whole box will be vegetables. And then I put the date on the bag and I, quarterly I'll go through my whole freezer and see what's in there and then pull things out that are getting old to plan my meals with. I think, you know, anything else you'd say on freezing, Jack? What do you like to freeze? Yeah, let's start off with the freezer audit. Like that's something that we had to make. We have three freezers, so we have to make ourselves do the freezer audit. Yeah, and we have two upright, really big freezers, and we have a chest freezer. And we primarily use the chest freezer now for workshops. So all the stuff we prepare for the workshops goes in the chest freezer. And honestly, usually what we end up doing is by the end of a workshop, we consolidate to those other two. We turn that thing off until next season because I don't like them. And I would advise anybody, if you're going to invest in a freezer, yes, the chest freezer is more efficient. Yes, you can fit more food per cubic foot into it because of the way it stacks versus shelves. But you find things in freezer audits like, oh, yeah. And it was all the way at the bottom. And I was like, you have to defrost it because it's like ice welded to the bottom of the freezer. But definitely grouping things like in milk crates or something like that is probably a great idea. Uh, I, I, too, am big on the individual freezing. I was talking yesterday about uh, some new vacuum seal bags that I found uh, from a company called Avid Armor. I really like them. And a, a tip that I threw out on that show was when you're freezing stuff in the bags, and maybe not a big thing of green beans or something, because I'm big on the cookie sheet, too. In fact, I think I know where you got that idea. Anyway, <laughs> um, I... Uh, I I would suggest taking meats and things like that that you're going to freeze, put them in your vacuum seal bags, throw the vacuum seal bag unsealed in the freezer, let it freeze. And then when you vacuum seal it, you get a perfect vacuum seal instead of having like blood, water and ooze come up the bag and ruin the seal. That's, that's kind of my tip of the week uh, repeated now on uh, vacuum sealing and freezing meats. Uh, but on the vegetables, like, Make sure we, you said blanch, but I don't think we told people what that means. So oh, yeah. that's like short cooking or par cooking or what have you. You can either do it with steam, steam, or you can do it with boiling. I I have an electric steamer with like multi layer baskets, and I like to do that. And you can just go blanching blanching vegetables time chart on Google, and you'll find how long steam or boil you need to blanch. And let me reiterate what you said about freaking green beans. Do not freeze a green bean without blanching it. Um, there's various vegetables that have various problems. If you don't blanch them, you pick the perfect one for not screwing it up. Cardboard, uh, it's more like a stick. Like I, <laughs> I did it when I was a kid. I grew like th these green beans in my grandmother's backyard down in Florida. And I had all these green beans. I'm like, I don't know what to do with them all. My grandma was like, freeze them. 
And that particular grandmother didn't really know about this kind of stuff. And so we just threw them in a bag and like you cook them and you cook them and you cook them and they never, ever, ever stop being hard. It is, it is a, a, I understand it's an enzymic thing, but it's still weird that like you would think if you cooked it long enough that it would become green bean mush. It doesn't like it's forever now. It's a stick. It's terrible. It's so that's funny. that's my add-on on the freezing. I have had green beans after being in the crock pot that were not blanched turn out okay, oddly enough. Uh, but they don't taste as good as if you blanch them. And same with broccoli. Like if you don't take broccoli, put it in boiling water or steam for about you know five minutes or so, and then freeze them, dry them, and then freeze them. Broccoli tastes terrible. It tastes like some sort of weird metallic iron thing. Um, I did see a question here. Somebody who's going keto asking about preserving meat in your live feed. And I have two ways I like to preserve meat. One is just in the freezer, like Jack said. And if you're processing your own animals, either pre-freeze it or buy a $900 vacuum chamber vacuum sealer, which is what I do now because I butcher a lot of animals. Then you don't have to do that because it stops before the blood comes out. But that pre-freezing method is great. Yeah. And, and like when I do ground meat, I'll actually measure one cup of ground and make little uh, like big ground meatballs and put those on a cookie sheet before I freeze them because I find it's it's actually easier than doing it in the vacuum sealer, the vacuum chamber sealer. So that's how I do that. The other thing that works really well is freeze drying. So you cook the meat the way you want it, and then you run it through a freeze dryer if you have access to a freeze dryer or if you have a freeze dryer. That's a great way to preserve meat if you're looking for longer term storage than you have space in your freezer. But really, I mean, frozen meat defrosted and cooked is good. You can can it as well. I, I do can chicken from time to time, but I find that, that that's only really good for a stew or for a sandwich salad afterwards. Um, I would do that in a situation where I don't have access to electricity to run the freezer and I'd be perfectly happy, but I'm happier with frozen, thawed and cooked. Yeah, I'm pretty big on meat gets frozen and there's other things we can do with it. Like biltong, biltong is a great use of it, but then you're going to eat it all. You're yeah. not going to store it very long once you turn it into biltong and certain things do not make biltong. Chicken, we do not make biltong with chicken. Um, as safe as most modern pork is, we do not make biltong with pork. We do not make biltong with things that carry trichinosis like pork or don't make raccoon biltong or porcupine biltong. I, I advise against that. Your beef is fine as that. Um, freeze drying, yes, sure. If you have a freeze dryer, which Nicole does, and we'll get into that in a moment. Um, canning, I love canning. I just, you gotta, like you said, you gotta think ahead. Like this is meat that you're gonna do like, I don't know, a meat pie with or a stew with or, you know, like I guess you could do shanks and basically you have pre-made oso busco. Um, a lot of things you can do like that, but it will never – you can't you can't can a steak, take it out of the can, throw it on the grill and eat steak. You're, you're going to eat beef stew uh, out of the can. That's what's, that's what's going to happen. You're, canning necessitates overcooking. That's how it works in my opinion. Like I don't know anything that actually – if I wasn't canning it other than like a stew, right. That I would cook that long, that hard and that hot. Uh, I cook a steak for instance, see, I, like I'm carnivores crazy, like, you know, predator. So I cook a steak to like 135. Uh, yeah. You're canning. I think canning temperatures and pressure canning for meat are somewhere like 244 once you pressurize the steam. So like you wouldn't ever cook a steak to 244 degrees. So you're not going to get steak out of it. And you're not, you wouldn't cook a green bean that way either. That's why I, for green beans, broccoli, any kind of green vegetable, if I have the freezer space, I much prefer a blanch and freeze. I mean, that's just much more preferable to me. Yeah, I actually like canned green beans, but I'm a weirdo. We have a question too. Um, will beef go bad in the? But this delay, you know, let's. Can you try bouncing out and bouncing back in real quick? Yeah, I am going to bounce out. Be right back. Because our delay is killing it. Yeah. Please hold, guys. She'll be back. That's a promise. Will beef go bad in the freezer? We had top round cut into steaks, frozen in separate packages. Last two were rancid, about two months. They must have been packaged wrong, Tom. That that should not happen. There's no difference in freezing ground beef than 
regular beef. Now, hopefully she'll get back in. I didn't screw this all up. We shall see. Can filet mignon. No, you have sinned against food if you do that, Hayes. <laughs> Add to stream. Okay, so is the yarn between our two cups better now? I think so. Let, let's let's try from here and see. Right. Um, let's let's move on uh, to our next food preservation method. We kind of skipped over on the list in order drying. Yeah. So that's freezing. Uh, drying, important. dehydrating, not freeze drying yet. Yeah. So drying. That I agree. Um, <laughs> what? Uh, drying is great. Drying is what you do if you have way too freaking much basil in your garden, which I do right now. And you bring it out and you don't want to put it in the freezer as pesto. You take it and I like to hang it upside down and just let the leaves dry and then pull the leaves off. And then I like to um, just have that air dried. But you can also use a de food dehydrator to do tomatoes. You can make jerky if you want to cut your meats up after curing them and, and make them into jerky, all sorts of stuff freeze dries. Well, some things, I mean, not freeze dry, but dries well, some things don't dry well though. And, and that's where you have to kind of jump in like potatoes, unless you pre cook them, not so good. And even then dehydrated potatoes that are not freeze dried are kind of, well, gelatinous after you reconstitute them. So you probably don't want to go there. On the other hand, apples work great. Fruit leather is good. Drying is a really low barrier to entry. And as long as you store it in a way where they are not in an oxygen-free, humid environment afterwards, which means if you put, if you don't dry them enough and put them in a bag and put them on the shelf, they could grow mold if they're high acid, or they can grow our friend botulism if they're low acid. So you want to make sure it's dried all the way, or you just throw it in a bag and I'll throw it in the fridge or the freezer if I'm worried about how long I dried it. Um, they'll store longer that way anyway. So that that's drying. Of course, herbs, when you take them all the way to dry, they're fine in a jar on your shelf. My favorite thing to uh, dry as far as vegetables go is actually squash, summer squash is green and yellow squash. And those work really well, as far as I'm concerned, as long as you're using them in soups and stews and stuff like that. Um, and, you know, unless it's really fresh squash that's only thrown at the very end, it gets kind of squashy anyway. So um, that's kind of the one that I do the most of. I used to do a lot of dehydrating. As I've moved more and more to a far more carnivorous lifestyle, I do a lot less of it. I have played with with drying eggs. So you scramble the eggs and then you put them in the dehydrator and you dehydrate the crap out of them. And those work decent. Um, if I didn't have any other method and I had a ton of eggs and I needed the freezer space uh, that I would normally use, because we usually we do, we just take four eggs, put them in a Ziploc bag, kind of half scrambled and freeze them. We put them in a, we'll take like a, a tray, uh, like a aluminum roaster tray, the throwaway ones, and we'll stack them in there so they don't, because if you don't, then they form around things like your freezer grate, and then they never come out ever. So you learn that. And so we'll set them in there. They're all stacked. And then once they freeze, they're like ice cubes, and we can pack them in to all the little nooks and crannies in the freezer. And then when you want eggs, you've got four eggs in every bag, right? So we'll do that with them. But if I didn't have the freezer space, I, I would say it's adequate. It's not as good as freeze drying. And it's definitely adequate for you guys that are backpackers and stuff like that to be yeah. able to take it with you on the trail. Yeah, the but that's about all I do with drying anymore. I'm not. Go ahead. I was gonna say the freeze drying uh, will weigh less on the backpack trip, but the drying yeah. works pretty well. We actually had duck egg palooza this year, where all of the duck eggs arrived in a four week period of time, right around my spring workshop. And so after we had fed as many eggs to visitors as we could, I still had probably. 50 dozen eggs sitting in a freezer. And I ended up scrambling that in sets of 24 eggs, freezing it in a vacuum sealed bag. And I will take one of those out and run the sous vide on it for if there's an event, you just sous vide it in the bag. And I already have salt and pepper in there. So I sous vide it in the bag yep. for about 45 minutes at, I think it's 135 I put that on. And those scrambled eggs, are still they're scrambled they're cooked all the way but they're not dry 
So they still preserve that nice mouthfeel of scrambled eggs that came fresh off the skillet and, and didn't sit around on your cast iron for too long. So that's, that's a great way to store eggs, um, freeze dried eggs. So once you can freeze dry them, Jack, you'll stop just drying them, but just dried or quote unquote, just dried eggs in, in a normal food dehydrator are going to be better than powdered eggs you get in a box at the store. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So you also have on your list root cellaring. Do you, do you have a root cellar? I don't think you do. I have a prepper pantry. My prepper pantry. Or, or do you have a be, root cellar? It's, it's, it's a, okay. it's a garage that's built half underground where when I moved in, there was a wood burning water okay. heater. There was a boiler system and there was a, a whole house generator that came out of a smelting factory. So there was no room to move in this. And I had all of that taken out because it wasn't functional anymore and realized that since it's half underground, I get most of a root cellar. So what I get is right at this time of year, it, it stays nice and cool in there. In the summer, it gets a little hot, but this time of year I can store, if I put onions in there now, I will have onions in March. And all I do is put onions, apples, potatoes, sweet potatoes, anything, garlic, my garlic from the yard. Uh, and I put that in there and I go through about once a week or once every two weeks and look for anything that's gone bad. Every time I get something sold to me in one of those fruit boxes, like a tomato box or an apple box, I keep those boxes so the things I harvest here can be store in, in my half underground garage. And it doesn't freeze in the winters, but it keeps at about between 34 degrees and 50 degrees, just because Tennessee has hot days in the summer. And it's a great way to keep things. I do squashes too. So I have Q-Shaw squash and I have Trombancino squash this year. Those will last almost to the end of February in my root cellar with, with no effort at all. And then that's almost like, having a grocery store on your property, which is really nice. The way I eke it out though. So for those who don't have a root cellar, if you have a cool room in your house that you keep extra air conditioned in the summer and you're getting these things. So sort of end of August into September, you can store like right now <laughs> I have two, I'm looking at them, two boxes of onions in my studio because this is the coolest room in the house. And I've had them here for a month. Those will move to the root cellar this week. Now that the hot weather has broken and then they'll be good at my spring workshop in, in April, probably I'll use, I usually use the last of my onions in April at that workshop. And it's a great way to keep things fresh without getting squishy, weird frozen onions out of your freezer or without drying them. Yeah. Yeah. Our cellar when I was a kid in PA was not really a root cellar, but it was a cellar and the cellar is a cellar. And, um, yeah, that was our big thing. So, like all the canned goods went down there mainly because there was space. Like they didn't need to be down there, but there was space for them and they wouldn't freeze, you know, they'd stay above freezing. And our, our biggest things we would would store down there was onions and garlic. And I mean, I would, I remember being a kid, I got so tired of it. Like we had these big screens that we lay out and I would pull garlic and pull garlic and pull garlic and then cut the greens off of them and set them on there. And then I'd end up hauling like, four onion bags, like 50 pound onion bags of garlic down in the cellar every year and about f five or six onions, you know, bags of onions like that. And we'd hang them up down there and they were always fine. I mean, like we always actually ended up giving some away even through the off season because there was just so many of them, which uh, I guess when you have kids doing all your work, like it's okay to grow extra onions and garlic, you know? Um, but that always worked really well for us. And I always like, I, I don't know. I maybe I'm weird. When I was a kid, I always liked spending time down there. Like it was quiet. It was cool in the summertime, you know, got away from people. I could go down there with my buddies and drink Yingling beer and get away with it. No one would find us. Um, I eventually, and I won't go into today how I acquired it, but I acquired a soda machine and uh, we had freeloader friends that came by looking for beers. Uh, so we would buy it back then. You could get a, a case of Milwaukee's best. And that's actually a brand. If anybody's never heard of this it, terrible beer, but we got, we would get by a couple of cases of Milwaukee's best and we would put it in the, the Coke machine. And then we set it to where it costs a dollar a beer. Can I have a beer? Yeah, they're a dollar, you know? <laughs> so we had our own little, uh, our little, uh, like a uh, teenager speakeasy 
down in the uh, in the root cellar. And I just I, I liked it down there. It was pretty cool. It's something I wish I could do here. Obviously, I can't. I would need dynamite to put a yeah. hole in the ground. But I would I would love to be able to do that because it's it's something I miss. Our house that we had. Um, I'm talking about my dad now. So my grandparents was a split level home, and we had a huge basement, and it was. It was awesome, man. I, I miss having basements living down here in Texas. Nobody has a basement here in Texas. It doesn't. I, and people say it's because of water tables or whatever, but I don't know if I buy into that. I maybe some parts of it, but I think a lot of it is just well, you have rock, so we're not going to make a hole there. Yeah, the the opportunity cost of blasting a hole for your root cellar will be lost in any money you save storing this stuff. <laughs> it would just be. Absolutely. Ooh, most expensive onions ever are at Jack Spierko's root cellar. Yeah. So what do you think about curing, Nicole? Curing? Uh, have, curing? have you gotten much into curing? Oh, yeah. I, I, so because I like to butcher animals, that means I like to do things like make ham and bacon and biltong, I, it, bruschetta, things like that. And really what you're doing is you're taking the meat and exposing it to uh, salt, usually some sort of salt related item or to pink salt or a combination of those things and sugar. And it, you just basically let it kind of dry a little bit and, and cure in those things. And, and you want to make sure you're storing the meat at the right temperature, like not too warm to do this. And what that does is make the meat resistant to breaking down. I think the easiest way to cure is just with salt. Just pack it with salt. And the reason we added pink salt to that is there's, you know, that ever present risk of botulism that everybody worries about. Very unlikely to happen if you have handled your meat right, because the way botulism would get in your meat is your meat touched the dirt where that toxin, where that organism lives, right? You know, just, I don't have botulism in my muscles here if you just cut my arm off and start curing it. So packing it in salt and then letting the liquid come off is sort of the basic framework of how curing works. And then from there, you can do all sorts of different things. My favorite ones are a wet brined ham that is then smoked because smoking is the other way you cure meat and exposing that to cold smoke rather than cooking it with smoke. Um really adds a good flavor. I've got a recipe that I'll actually shoot you after this, Jack, that makes a deer ham taste very close to a ham. So I'll take a venison butt, basically like the, the actual rear end of a, of a deer and cure that bone in. And then I cure it for about two weeks in a wet brine with some juniper berry salt. I do use a little pink salt in that and garlic dried onions, dried rosemary, and some other flavors. And then I cold smoke that for about eight hours. And then I store it in the freezer until I'm ready to eat it. And then I just bake it in my, or, or use my turkey roasting oven and roast it. And it's, it changes because of the pink salt, it changes the mouthfeel of the meat and tastes really close to ham. It is so, so good. So once you get into curing, it's like there's unlimited things you can do. And then Biltong, Jack, you need to talk to us about Biltong. It's the whole purpose of this show is to hear you talk about Biltong again, which I like to refer to as meat gummy bears. Yeah, we have somebody committing a sin in the comments right now comparing Biltong to jerky. Biltong is not jerky. It, honestly, you mentioned like a prosciutto ham or a really great high quality, you know, piece of pork that's been cured Italian style where the meat almost has a, a wetness in the interior. And it's, it's, you know, if you slice it thin, it's kind of translucent when you make biltong, right? It's, it's sort of what you're doing. Biltong, we need jerky. You go thin stri slices of meat traditionally before smokers and dehydrators and all it was dried in the sun. So it was a very quick dry, um, Biltong is always made in the dry season. If you're going to do it in traditional way where it's made out in the open, which I don't really recommend, um, it's easier to do inside and it's safer because less flies and stuff like that. So they, it comes from South, South Africa. And I mean the area where the country is not Southern African continent, South Africa. It was originally uh, started by the Boers, uh, D Dutch settlers. And you take thick pieces of meat. I mean like baby's arm thick hunks of meat. And you dredge it in apple cider vinegar first. And then 
you hit it with salt, black pepper, and coriander. And in traditional biltong, a lot of people use uh, Worcestershire sauce now. Couldn't have been in traditional biltong. Worcestershire sauce wasn't invented when they started making biltong, but it doesn't hurt anything to use that too. And you throw that in the refrigerator overnight. And then all I do, if I was making it right now, you would see it hanging behind me here and you'd see my dogs longingly looking up at it. I just take a rope and I string it across my office behind me so I can snack on it as it's curing. And I take um, paper clips and you just unbend them so they're like an S hook and you put a piece in and you tie knots in your cord and you hang it up there. And maybe you run a fan in here to keep the air nice and dry. But an air conditioned room in the winter time in Texas or probably, you know, um, a heated room in the winter time in upstate area. Um, that's all you need to do. And you want to do it that way. And I've had so many people that want to put it in the dehydrator. So I put it in the dehydrator and it ruins it. Uh, it's not terrible, but it's not right. Like it's like you're like, that's not the way it's supposed to be. And the reason is you're drying it too quickly for the process. The process is supposed to be a slow process. And the other thing that happens is with the with a dehydrator, even on a very low setting, you're kind of drying it from the middle out. Well, when you air dry it, it's drying from the outside in. And you can look up a biltong box if this makes you feel better. It's basically a, a breathable box with a light bulb in it to keep it dry. Unless you live in a really, really, really humid place and you don't run central air, you don't need it. If you live in like Southern Florida and you are crazy and you don't have an air conditioner running all the time in your home, Maybe you need a biltong box, but it's something to play with. And the, again, try it the most basic way the first time you do it. Dredge it in apple cider vinegar, or you can get a squirt bottle with it. Spray it with apple cider vinegar. Um, hit it with salt, pepper, and coriander. And I people always want a recipe like how much salt. And, you know, it's it's you want it everywhere, but you don't want it caked. Right. If you cake it, it's going to taste like a salt brick. Right. It's like think of a really good uh, soft pretzel and kind of the amount of salt that's on that and probably a little bit more dense than that. Pepper as much as you like, coriander as much as you like, you know, depending on how you like it. And the original reason for the black pepper was actually that since they made it outside, if you put enough black pepper on it, the few flies that are kind of around in that time of year, it keeps them off of it though I've tried making it that time of year here outside and we had fly problems. So I, 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 again, I advise doing it indoors and doing it in the winter time. Yeah. And that built on, what do you box, think, Nicole? Um, if you don't have, if you just have a box with a screen on it, that keeps the flies out. So if you have a fly problem in your house or wherever you are doing this, you can build a box that flies can't get through the mesh of the screen and it just keeps them off. I, I, I don't know. I usually just hang it in in my back cold office that's half underground. It works great when I do it. And my dogs aren't allowed back there, so they can't gaze longingfully at it like yours do. But it is biltong is one of my favorite things. The other thing is you'll you'll do. So the way I, I cut the meat when I'm getting it ready is I'll take it and I'll have chunks that are maybe two an inch or two thick. And they're wider, sort of steaky like. And it'll be usually a whole muscle group if I'm doing venison, right? Like, so I'll take some, a muscle here or one, you know, not that, probably not that one, but something here. I will make it into biltong, making sure the silver skin is off. And then when you're serving it, you cut it against the 90 degree angle to the grain of the meat thinly. So it biltongs out, which is drying from the outside in. And that apple cider vinegar helps with the curing as well as the salt. And then you end up with a hard outer crust and a meat gummy bear with good flavor. Uh, the other thing I thought is I like to use either the kosher, like big chunky salt or rock salt on that, as opposed to really, really ground up salt. Yeah, I haven't made it with the Redmonds yet, but I've always used kosher because since it's bigger, you can get a better eyeball on it. I mean, it would work with anything, but, but a heavier salt I don't know if Redmond's makes kind of like a kosher grain salt, but I, I have a feeling it would come out really good because I've started using the Redmond salt a lot. I'm like my dry brining. So I always dry brine steaks. I dry brine pork chops. I dry brine chicken. And the difference is amazing. And I don't really know exactly what extra minerals are in there that does it. But if you dry brine 
you know, a, a New York strip with kosher salt and you dry brine a New York strip with Redmond's and you put it side by side, the Redmond's one is so much redder. It, it has, it, it, and if you do a pork, it gets a little hammy, not, it doesn't become a ham, but it gets that, that darker red pinkish color. And it's not for the reason what we, when we say pink salt, we're talking about a curing salt made mm -hmm. to be a curing salt. They make it pink so you don't confuse yourself and like dump it on your French fries and freaking stroke out, right? Oh, that's wow, that's that why they do that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. If you ate enough of that, that could be really bad for you. So that's why they, they color it that way. So the Redmond salt has some pinkness to it, but it's its natural, you know, mineral content. But I'd love to – I've never done it, but I'd love to try it. But I'm with you on the, the thicker salt. And it's one of those things people want a recipe for. And um, – if you think of the, I think his name's the Farmstead Meatsmith or the Homestead Meatsmith, the Brandon guy from the Northwest. He talks about it a lot when he's using salt to cure meats that I don't even want to tell you how much. Mm -hmm. Like I don't want to, I don't want to do that because I don't want to take from you. Like you need to learn to eyeball it. And if you make something and it was way too salty. And then Jack is the one whose connection went out. Yeah, I really, uh, the funny thing about preserving things, uh, the curing of meats and even fermenting of foods is that it's, there are recipes for it, but you end up with eyeballing it and it's not even all that important how much salt you use or how much, you know, salt you use in a ferment or in a curing recipe, because what's going to happen is the meat will absorb what it needs to, to absorb. And with fermentation, even with a really light salt, you're probably going to end up with a, a very successful sauerkraut because you're basically allowing the, the bacteria that already exist on, on the cabbage that you're making sauerkraut out of to, um, to do their job. And that means that if there's a lot of salt, it might actually inhibit them. If there's not enough salt, they're probably going to be fine unless bad bacteria get in there. And then if bad bacteria get in there, you're going to know it because it smells like a poopy diaper and whatever. You throw that one away. It's, it is a learning process. And, and it's why when I'm teaching people how to make sauerkraut, I officially have a ratio of what the weight of cabbage is to how much to two tablespoons of salt. But when I'm making it, I'm just kind of like throwing some salt on the cabbage. Are you back with us, Jack? I'm back. Can I be heard? You can be heard. All right. StreamYard lied and said my microphone was disconnected, but I I, I didn't believe it. Uh, yeah. I'm not dead. I have returned. And I'm wondering if maybe my equipment malfunction was why we were getting such a delay. I hope so. In the words of my grandson when he was three years old and wanted a bike and we told him to get one soon. Um, but yeah, I, I guess you were finishing up on Bill Tong for me there because uh, I, I faded out. Um, let's move on to freeze drying because you got a freeze dryer, which I think is awesome the way that you did it. Like, because when people were asking me about the freeze dryers early on, I'm like, I don't know that you'll ever get your money back on one. But if you do it with a community and you share the resource, sure, or you're able to pick one up, you know, used and get a discount on it because somebody else figured out they couldn't make it work, then then maybe you can. So I know Jake was able to get one used. Did you guys go in in your community together or like Jake, did you get it at a discount? Did you do both? How'd you end up with one? There's a tale of two freeze dryers in my future, but what <laughs> we did. <laughs> so Jake actually was the catalyst for this. I bought some freeze dried hamburger from him and then I've started backpacking again and staying ketogenic while backpacking is a totally different approach than most backpackers do, right? So I thought, well, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll cheat and I'll get dehydrated potatoes and I'll bring bouillon cubes and I'll bring beef and then I'll have jerky and some a, a couple of tins of oysters and see what happens and see if I'm starving. And so I bought the beef from him and it changed my life because it was so tasty out and when you're backpacking and your food is tasty it's tastier than it's ever been before in your entire life because you're really hungry after a day of walking through the woods and i came back and my mom is is like a through hiker dixie scale sort of hiker and she said you know i'll go in on that with you and i said okay so i started looking for a used one turned out about the best price i could get was two thousand dollars 
and a new one's $2,700 and it's new. So we decided to um, just go for a new one and bought it for the community. So we have four families who live all together in the holler. We call ourselves the holler neighbors. And several of them like to backpack. Um, all of us are creating food and they're growing food here and preserving it sort of more as a community, which makes it a little easier than all by yourself. And then one of them wants to do some cottage food things with freeze dried butternut squash. And so it's, it's outside in my outdoor kitchen and anybody can use it. Who's who knows how to use it here. And we just use it if we want to. So far, I'm the one who's used it the most. And the thing I have freeze dried the most is my raw milk that I get because I get a gallon of raw milk a week and I use one quart of it and I either make cheese or freeze dry it now. And the second thing are those surplus eggs that we were talking about earlier. So I have all these frozen eggs now that I'm just using up, but the freeze dried powder eggs, when you rehydrate them, it's difficult to tell it was ever freeze dried. It's very well scrambled. So it's like, you know, when you scramble eggs, you might have some, a little white here, a little yolk there. And that's kind of nice. That's not how freeze dried eggs are. It's as if mm. you put it in a blender and then you rehydrate it. The key to making it the right consistency is the right amount of water. You rehydrate at one to one ratio. So a cup of eggs gets a cup of water, except what I do is I do a little bit less than a cup of water. And it makes it 100% better. So I love it as a sort of an advanced preserving tool. And then you can sell this stuff. So you can do all sorts of stuff. You can say to a farmer, I'll trade you freeze-dried product if you give me free eggs, for example. I know Jake does that. He gets uh, 60 eggs in a batch and he gives them about 25% back freeze-dried. And then he has it or he can sell it. You can do that with eggs. You can do it with milk. I recently did a test of air dried, frozen and freeze dried basil. And the freeze dried basil is off the charts because it's it's that vibrant green color that you get off the plant. The flavor is phenomenal. And and then it's just light and airy. So when you use it in your cooking, it just instantly absorbs any moisture when it goes in there. So the the flavor of cooking with the freeze dried basil over the air dried is far superior. So it's, it's a tool that we're using here to extend things. And then also some things are just better freeze dried and some things are not better freeze dried, mm. you know, a steak, you can cook a steak, freeze dry a steak, rehydrate a steak. And if it's a very lean steak, it'll probably be pretty good. Um, but if it's a super thick steak, that inside area won't rehydrate right. So you need to have thinner steaks, right? Well, at that point, you might as well just freeze the stupid thing. And, you know, the only reason you'd want a freeze dried steak at that point is to store it for 20 years. And I don't store anything for 20 years. I store things for a year or two as part of my philosophy of life. There's no point in 25 year storage. It just isn't. Jake, take us back to 2007. All right. So they, anyway, want me, they want me to do a rant. I told them maybe Friday, this isn't a rant type of show. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't know if I can incite you into a rant. I mean, I could, I could claim that well done steaks are the best. Would that do it? Especially if you said well done steak, freeze dried, rehydrated with ketchup <laughs> on it, that, that might do it. Right. Like <laughs> I, I think what, what freeze dryers do really well for beef, chicken, pork, et cetera, is, what canning does like when you talk about trail food well if you want to make like a trail beef stew assuming you can get water on trail so you're not lugging it around like you can make a really light pouch and all you need to do is add some really hot water to it and you can eat it right out of the pouch if you want to and mm -hmm. it's it's fantastic like for that type of thing so if the beef the chicken the pork whatever you would fully cook then it and then you would use it in some sort of a dish yeah. it works i do have several tins of commercially um freeze dried pork chops you'd be hard pressed when they're rehydrated and then you throw them on the grill and kind of cook the outside so they get the brownness to them you'd be hard pressed to know that they weren't just pork chops but you would say they're probably a little overcooked is how you'd feel yeah. about them you know um I've done freeze dried shrimp 
that's good in like some if you're doing like a Thai soup or something like that, like they're great for that. It's still not it's not equivalent experience. Some stuff is an equivalent experience. Like you you almost couldn't tell yeah. that it was what it was freeze dried. You mentioned the basil. I recently put an order because I don't have a freeze dryer for some dried things that I buy in bulk. I dry I buy dried onions and I dry buy dried garlic in, in bulk because I'm honestly not gonna do the work to to dry onions and garlic. It's too much work. Um, and so I, I, whenever I buy stuff like that, I buy gallons or pounds. Uh, and then I buy extra things in smaller amounts because why not? You're already paying for the shipping. And I ordered um, freeze-dried cilantro. I wish I would have ordered more uh, because I've never found a dried cilantro to be worth it. You might as well not put it in there. It turns green. It makes it pretty. And there's no flavor. There's right. no cilantro flavor. The freeze-dried cilantro, like one of my things I do when I'm fasting and doing my intermittent fasting, and I'm like, I do want something before 2 o'clock, um, I'll throw a, a cup of bone stock in the microwave because it's like 20 calories or whatever, and I'll throw a handful of that freaking freeze-dried cilantro, and it is outstanding. Mushrooms are good freeze-dried. Mushrooms are much better freeze dried than dried as far as when you bring them back around and, and what have you. But like when you say you freeze dry milk, what does that look like? Oh, wow. You can't dump the milk on the, you know, great. Like, I guess you put it in a sauce. I mean, how I do mean, you okay, so if Tactical Redneck is on this live stream, he could totally just go into my beef stock cabinet and bring a jar out and I could hold one up for everybody. But you end up with a milk powder. Here's the reason I'm doing this, Jack. So I have been stuck at a weight line for a year. I go above it and I get down to it. I don't go below it. I cut out all commercial milk. Okay. And and I'm getting raw milk from a local farm and I went below that line. And the problem is in October, no more goat milk for me. Because goats dry up for the winter. And so with my extra milk, I'm freeze drying it so I can put it in my coffee. The only place I use milk is in my coffee. And what I do is I take milk and I add cold water to it. That's the key. So you take okay. the powder, you add cold water. I have one of those little electric frothers to mix it really quickly, really easily. They're like 10 bucks to get one of those. And then it, I just use it like I would milk. I can steam it at that point. This is what a jar, this is one gallon of milk ends up a quick okay. jar. And, and that's, it's, it's just like having the milk. I get that. I'm saying like when it goes into the freeze dryer. Oh, uh, is it I, just like put it in a shallow dish. I mean, like, how do you I get how you take a cooked pork chop and throw it in there and freeze dry it. Yeah. How do you do a liquid? I guess is more what I'm liquid. saying. So the the trays have a little lip. OK. And there are two ways to do it. The way I do it is I have leveled my freezer. Okay. And I put a quart per tray. So I'll measure it in that quart jar, pull it in, pour it in. And then I have these little stacking corners that you could totally print with a 3D printer. I stack the next tray. So I pour it in the freezer and I pre-freeze it so that I'm not, you know, juggling this long tray of liquid and spilling it everywhere. Other people put it in their freeze dryer and pour it in. I get better results pre-freezing it. I was going to say this though about milk. Goat's milk is kind of not as fatty as cow's milk right okay so you can do a 50 percent ratio of water to milk and get a higher fat in your coffee so it's almost like you freeze dry it and then you you get closer to a heavy whipping cream consistency by using less water so you do rehydrate the dehydrated milk before it goes in the coffee you don't let the coffee rehydrate yeah because the hot water cooks the fat got you and so you uh, don't want to do that mm -hmm. uh, you'll, have, you'll, have, you'll have grainies yeah I got you. So yeah. have you ever tried dehydrating like cream? I have not dehydrated cream. I have read on forums that that does not work too well if the okay. fat content's too high. Mm -hmm. mm, too bad. That sounds good. Yeah. And the other thing is it'll go <laughs> bad. Like yeah, I can store it for a year. No problem. Even this milk, if I store it for a really long time, the fats will, will go rancid over time in freeze dried foods. Got you. So high, right. you, know, you can't do butter. It's just going to end up mushy butter. So let's talk about some of your favorite recipes. Yeah. Well, you all know about Aunt Helen's pickled beets, right? I do not. You don't know about Aunt Helen. So my Aunt Helen was my grandmother's sister. So she's really my great aunt. 
and she grew up in Oregon as did most of my, that, that, or that era of family. And my aunt Helen had a big heart and she loved everybody. And she also had a big garden and she would take her beets and she would pickle her beets and everybody wanted these beets and she would not share the recipe. One year she put it in the Oregon state fair and the Oregon state fair, they actually taste the canned goods. They don't just, they don't just, you know, look at them in the jar like they do in Tennessee. If it looks pretty in the jar, you get an award. They taste it. She won first prize. Cool. So I actually, I'm going to share this recipe on your podcast. And the key to Aunt Helen's pickled beets is that you need to have sugar. So here's the <laughs> brine. You take one quart of vinegar, like normal 5% white vinegar and six cups of sugar and you, and two tablespoons of salt. And you heat that up so that it's all a brine. And then she, her recipe called for two teaspoons of pickling spice. What I really do, I don't do that. I use cloves. I use ginger. I use dill. I use peppercorns. I use garlic and I use cayenne or some sort of hot pepper and mix that all up. And that's pickling spice. It's so tasty. So you take that and I'll put those dried spices in each jar. And then for the beets, what I do is I bring them to a boil for five minutes, turn the heat off and let it, let it cool down. And you do this at the volume of a stock pot, right? Like a gallon and a half, two gallon stock pot of beets to water, let them cool down. And then to peel them, you can just take your hands and squeeze them out of their skins. It's so much easier than taking an apple peeler and laboriously peeling every beet. So that's tip number one. Then you pack those in the jar with the pickling spices, bring the brine to a boil, pour it over the beets so that there is a half inch of head space. And then you hot water bath can them, which means bring them to a boil with water over the top of the jars with the lids down for 20 minutes for um, quarts and I'm sorry, for pints and 25 minutes for quarts. Those beets go on Jack's barter blanket every year. And I always get something really good for them because they're so tasty. And here's the key. So you eat the beets, which are yummy. And yes, they have more sugar than most of us ketogenic people want. So that's a treat. Uh, you get the brine left and you take your quail eggs that you've hard boiled and you put them back in that brine and put them in the fridge for about a week. And you end up with these really tasty purple nurples. So oh yeah. It's function stacking, Jack. Yeah, absolutely. I love pickled quail eggs. I don't like peeling them, but I love eating them. Um, and I love pickled eggs. So you can throw eggs in there too. Purple, mm -hmm. little purple nurples are good. Big purple nurples are pretty good too. I like the little ones. Um, I'd add throw, throw a handful of jalapenos in there when you put the quail eggs in. Yeah. And then add that flavor to them and, and, and they're fantastic. And I'm big on reusing pickling juice anyway like if i if i buy some sort of pickled vegetable and it's really good then when all the vegetables out of there something's going back in that jar like yeah. you know like quail's eggs i don't keep quail anymore when i did it would be quail's eggs or uh duck's eggs or garlic like that is like one of the like that's a layup is to like when you're pickled whatever you purchased ran out assuming you like the flavor of the brine that you got um just take a few heads of garlic and you know remove the paper and throw the cloves in and throw that back in the refrigerator for a couple of days and that is that's money with cooking with salads with just pop if you like garlic like that you just popping it uh and, and eating it and i'll give you a, hit, a tip for the garlic instead of sitting i have a little it looks like a little piece of inner tube basically, except it's colored red. So, you know, it's not, and you can take it and you can peel garlic cloves with them. Uh, I guess they're called garlic peeling tubes and yeah. you're peeling a couple, you throw a couple in there and you roll it back and forth and the uh, paper comes off. If you want to do like a shitload of garlic at one time, take a Tupperware thing, throw all your garlic in there. Make sure you only feel like a third of the Tupperware thing. When you do this, put about enough water, to barely cover them, close your Tupperware lid properly. <laughs> shake the shit out of it and it will peel all your garlic like unless you have like if you ever i had one time i had some uh like an italian red it was really really tight and it didn't work so well when i tried to do that with it uh but most of your like especially garlic you'd buy you'll find that it peels really really well so yeah reuse reuse whether you made the pickling juice or you 
you know, I go to a lot of like craft fairs and stuff like that. And I'll always buy like pickled stuff because I like it. And I always reuse it because it's just too easy. Yeah, it's it's a great way to get a lot of uses out of something. And I will say this on the quail eggs, that same philosophy you just said works. You fill about half a mason jar with quail eggs that are hard boiled and water and then shake the crap out of it. It makes it way easier to peel them. They're still a pain in the butt to peel, but that's easier than using like they they make a tool that cracks the shell that you can use like one yeah. at a time. Meep, meep. Not good. And I see a question in the chat about if I can ship my cookbook to Mexico. I do have a cookbook, Cook With What You Have. We are about to relaunch it with a much bigger preservation chapter. So yes, I can. I recommend waiting probably two months right now. And I'll totally like, I'll put a thing out about that to everybody as soon as it's updated. But that's going to have a big preservation chapter added to the entire thing. Joe Tippett says. I'll sell my book. Joe Tiva says pickles are a waste of a perfectly fine cucumber. See, now here's the thing. You, how many cucumbers do you have to eat out of your garden in November, Nicole? Probably not many. And I know you have none in January. None. Because they all die. Yeah, you could grow it inside, but that'd be a huge waste of electricity. Oh, it's so much effort, right? And pickle, I, I think one of the problems that people have with pickling too is everybody thinks cucumbers. Everybody thinks pickles. But I think only in America do we call pickled cucumbers pickles everybody else calls them pickled cucumbers because pickles mm -hmm. in most countries just means something was usually some sort of vegetable was pickled because there's all kinds of things that we can pickle and i think like one of my favorite ways and we i think we skipped over this during our technical glitches but um is pickling through fermenting yes right and like one of my favorite things to ferment is uh jerusalem artichokes because they're delicious. Uh, they're low glycemic. So they're, they're, you know, you can't eat a plate of them, but a few are not going to hurt you, even if you're on keto. Um, and even if you eat only a few, if you eat them raw or roasted, they have a side effect, which makes some people refer to them as fartichokes uh, because of the way they break down in the stomach. And it's the good news is it's not bad from an olfactory standpoint, but it is, <laughs> you know. It's a noisy thing. I'll just put it that way. And when you when you ferment them, they don't do that. I don't know why, but they don't. You know, I mean, they just don't do it at all. And they have a, an amazing flavor. Like and like we're talking about producing our own food and then preserving it. Like if you can't grow Jerusalem artichokes, like I don't know that maybe you should be growing things. You should just like find a good grower and buy locally because that's probably the easiest you know, most reliable thing to grow from zones, oh, nine to two, right? That's pretty much everybody can do it. Um, Be so careful I, where you plant those. Oh, if you don't want them there, don't put them there. Yeah, I, I planted Jerusalem artichokes my first year here because I loved them so much and they were so expensive at the store and I'd never seen one as a plant. Okay. And it bloomed and I was like, I have Jerusalem artichokes. I'm so excited. And I looked around the holler where I live and I was surrounded by Jerusalem artichokes growing wild. All the farmers were laughing at me. They're like, you planted those? What do you think? <laughs> so I transplanted some to this area we disturbed last year. Yeah. My Jerusalem artichokes were two of me tall. They were over yeah. 10 feet tall. Yeah, they're big. This year. They're big. I will tell you if they're spreading from an area, you know, it sounds like you had some actually go to seed, which is not real common. Um, but they usually spread as the tubers go out yeah. and they're very aggressive. What they'll do, like uh, I, not here, but another place where I grew asparagus, I had one, it grew out and it hit an asparagus crumb uh, in the off season and it, it went down underneath it. And then in the spring, when the new plant grew, it literally blew the asparagus <laughs> crumb up out of the ground to, to, to take its place. That's how, you know, aggressive they are. And they seem like this, this Franken plant that's just going to go everywhere. Yeah. Um, when they're about a foot and a half tall, the tuber that they grew from is empty. Like if you pull it out of the ground at that point, it's just hollow. And if you just don't do anything and let them get up a foot and a half, 20 inches tall, then you just pull them all out and they come out like just easy. If you try to pull them out, like you think, I know what I'll do. I'll get ahead of this. And you pull them out when they're little. That makes them angry, 
right? And then they start sending, they're like, oh, like it's like they have this weird intelligence. Yeah. And then they're like, no. And they start sending out all these runners and they put their energy into runners. And each runner becomes a long little tuber. And then millions of them come up. I learned that from Dave Jackie. It's probably the best thing he ever taught me uh, about controlling them. Then the other thing is you can grow them in a container. And I don't necessarily mean a pot, but some sort of containment system. Um, I have some, you've seen them. They're fiberglass, about four foot by four foot tubs that were previously used for cattle. And I don't grow them in there anymore because I've repurposed what I do with them now. But I grew um, Jerusalem artichokes in there and I just took, one artichoke, cut it in half and put two pieces in there. And I had millions. But when it was harvest time, most of the tubers, because they have that runner. And then when they hit something, they, that's where they, that's where they actually set because that helps them displace other plants. Well, what they do is they all set around the edge. So all you have to do to harvest is you just stick your hand down the edges and they're just lined all around the edges. And they're a great, great plant. Just like Nicole said, if you put them somewhere and you don't want them there, well, they might be around a while. They're going to be around. And I actually propagate them on purpose on my property because I figure if it grows wild here and it will feed me, it takes me no effort to grow it. And it's just there if I ever need it. So I think and almost every edge habitat I've seen in Middle Tennessee that hasn't been messed with has Jerusalem artichokes in it. Right Sepp next to the Black Eyed Susan. Sepp Holzer grows them at the Kermaterhof and he runs his hogs through areas. He grows them. And like each year it's a new group of hogs because the other hogs have graduated. Yes. And so what he'll do when the hogs are coming through, he'll pull a couple up and pigs are pretty smart critters. And once they understand what's down there, they'll uproot them. And so he'll pull, actually pull some in advance so he can re because it's all tore up by yeah. the pigs and he'll just go toss some new ones back in and step them in the ground. And he feeds his pigs every year. That's a great uh, way. Not 100%, obviously, but he, you know, that's a big uh, uh, calorie boost for his pigs. So pigs eat them. I know cattle will eat them, but I don't know that they would eat them without you. Like, they're not as smart as a pig. I don't know if goats or anything eat, eat else eat them, but I know pigs. Like, once a pig knows, uh, that's uh, it's like a nut sedge. It's not nut sedge. It's like, uh, God, I can't think of what it's called now. There's a little thing that grows in the ground. Uh, that they make some kind of drink out of in Egypt. And it's supposed to be this noxious weed or whatever. But if you raise turkeys, like you pull three up, the turkeys go, oh, I see. And then you don't have any more at the end. And the turkeys just kill them. Chufa? It might be, it's Chufa, I think is what it's called. Hmm. We're off topic now. That's okay. <laughs> That's what happens when we talk, Jack. We go yeah, off topic. Yeah, we're off topic well, now. And ferment, so back to the pickle thing, fermenting. I talked a little bit about it when you had your mic meltdown. It's, it's a great way and an easy way to preserve. And the whole purpose of fermenting is to raise the acidity level through, you know, through that process so that things last longer. So they used, before we had canning, we had fermenting and you would ferment in crocs and you could do cabbage, you could do pick like cucumbers, you could do anything. And it would, it would hold that acidic environment so that the things stayed good throughout the winter or good, you know, edible. And, um, it's so easy. Again, it's so easy to do. You just throw something on your counter and, and let her rip, put a little salt in there, put a little water in there and let her rip there. There are recipes you can follow. Sometimes it fails. You know, I'll, I'll hear people say, why did it fail? It's like, I don't know why it failed. It may have been too warm. You may have gotten bad bacteria. It could have been the food was bad going in. You may not have sterilized your jar. I don't usually sterilize my jars. I just wash them. If there was something bad in there, it'll have it go bad. But if you're if you're into fermented foods like kimchi or sauerkraut or any of these things, it's it's very easy to do it yourself and ends up tasting better than most of the commercial ferments you can buy. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, like you're not going to kill yourself. It's either going to clearly be bad or it's going to be OK. Right. Yeah. And and like there's a, 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 a saying in fermentation, keep it under the brine and everything will be fine. Right. So mm -hmm. we're talking vegetables here, obviously. But like if you're doing cabbage for cold, uh, sauerkraut or something like that, then basically you shred it up and you add salt and you kind of develop a feel for it. Like Nicole said, you can look up recipes so that you can kind of figure out this much should have about that much salt. But I don't ever measure salt when I make sauerkraut. I like mix some salt in it, pack it in, mix some salt in another bit of it, pack it in and keep doing that till the jar is full. And with 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 
cabbage, it, it, it bleeds moisture so fast, it'll end up under the brine, but you haven't yeah, actually yeah. made a brine. The cabbage made the brine for you. With a lot of vegetables, like I'm big into making escabeche, uh, and I make my escabeche. And if you come down here to Texas, you go to a hole in a wall Mexican place, they'll always put a little cup of condiment on your table with you. And it'll be basically jalapenos, onions, uh, and carrot. And it's, you know, nobody really takes the time in a commercial environment anymore to do fermentation anymore. So it's done with vinegar. And that's the Mexican excavate. Um, I make mine carrot, onion, jalapeno, and sweet peppers to lessen it. And garlic, because then when you're done eating it, there's all this wonderful garlic in the bottom. Yum. And when you do something like that and you don't get enough moisture from the vegetables, you have to actually make a brine. And I just looked it up so I didn't kill anybody today or anything. <laughs> a tablespoon of kosher, kosher salt per cup of water. That's, yeah. that, that's your basic recipe. Um, I guess Alton Brown would tell you you're better off doing it with a scale because did you use kosher salt or did you use fine grain salt? And then a tablespoon's a little different. You know what? Your grandma didn't give a shit about that no. stuff. You know, she knew how much salt to use. Like, and I, it, you know, it's funny. Like, if you cook a lot and you just start paying attention to what you're doing, you end up not needing a lot of measuring devices or anything anyway. I was at, I was doing something here one year at a workshop and I said something about a tablespoon of salt. And so I took the kosher salt and I poured it in my hand and I saw some people like kind of, you know, like snicker or whatever. And I'm like, Oh, you think so? So I got a tablespoon out and I put it in that spoon and I ran my finger and it was dead level one tablespoon. And people are like, wow. I'm like, don't be impressed. Like if you do anything enough over and over again, you can do that. If you go into a deli and you say, I want a pound and a half of ham and the guy goes, Shh, and he throws it up on there and he's like within a you know tenth of it. It's not the guy working the deli at Albert's says, isn't a genius. He just does it all the time. Yeah. And like when you're cooking, just be fearless, man. You know, unless it's something that's going to kill you, let your mistakes teach you. It's okay. Yeah. And even having that brine ratio a little bit wrong. It's fine. If you've read wild fermentation by Sandor Katz, Dude yeah. just started putting vegetables under some salt water. Like yeah. he, did, he he doesn't really measure much. Yeah, absolutely. He's like, it'll either work or it won't. <laughs> what what else you got for us, Nicole? Well, I what see, do you want? I don't know. You got sausage here on your list. Okay, so I thought we should trade sausage recipes. Okay. The problem is my sausage recipe is not a recipe. So if okay. you have sausage at my house, it'll be different all the time. But it comes from so my grandfather ran a restaurant called Darby's in Newburgh, Oregon. And the way he came into that is he was in the CCC back in the day when the CCC was a thing. And he made breakfast there. So he started out breakfast cooking for the CCC, then got this restaurant. And then they started coming to his restaurant. This was during that time when that was necessary. And he would serve rabbit once a week. Just from rabbits he grew he grew most of his vegetables because that kept his costs down so he was he was keeping costs down and he had a really good breakfast sausage recipe and what he does is he takes ground pork and the spices he mixes in are are very simple it's garlic salt sage a little bit of rosemary and a little bit of basil and you know if he wanted to go spicy he would have added a, a cayenne powder but that was it. And people would come from all over just for this. And, and he was just, again, making it from scratch because he knew that that would keep the prices down. So that's my sausage recipe. What's your sausage recipe? So my uh, basic sausage, uh, this is like a breakfast sausage recipe, is not much different. And if you go to the survivalpodcast.com and stick sausage recipe in the, in the uh, box, you'll be able to find it. This is per pound. So one pound of pork, one teaspoon of fennel, half teaspoon of crushed red pepper flake. Omit if you don't like the spice. Uh, half teaspoon of salt, a pink salt like uh, Redmond's is what I prefer. A half teaspoon of black pepper, a half teaspoon of an Italian seasoning uh, of your choice, a teaspoon of garlic powder, a teaspoon of onion powder, and four finely chopped sage leaves. And do not use dry sage. Not in your sausage. <laughs> grow sage. Like this sage is another, like if you can't grow Jerusalem artichokes, sage and mint, you have a, I don't know, you have, I was gonna say a black thumb, but it's worse than that. You have well, like an acid thumb. I have sage in my aquaponics system and my dog named Sage died this year and we buried her in August. Okay. And, and I ripped off, like just ripped off part of the plant and stuck it on her grave. 
you know what I have on her grave now? Sage. A big sage plant. Yeah. 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 It's, you, you, yeah. I was talking to somebody recently on air and um, I said, I grow so much sage. Sometimes we compost it and they were like, wow. And I'm like, it's Texas. Don't, <laughs> this is not a bragging thing. I'm just pointing out that it, it really, really, really grows. It grows in the desert by itself. Come on guys. Like, you know, why do you think Indians burned it as an offering? Cause it wasn't really that big of a deal to burn some sage, right? Like, okay. It smells good too. Um, but yeah, that's my, that's my basic sausage recipe. I got a bunch of sausage recipes. If you go to TSP and, and type sausage in, I've done whole shows on sausage, but yeah, I'm a, I'm a big believer in sausage. I think I'm going to gift myself this year with my long talked about, but never yet purchased Lem sausage stuffer to do yeah. stuffing. Cause I have like a badass grinder. I mean, it's, it's not like a Cabela's carnivore, but it's like one level down from that. And it costs a third of the price. So it's good enough. And it does stuff sausage, but a grinder with a stuffer attachment is not a stuffer. Yeah. It will get you by. But Dorothy and I made like 30 pounds one year from a deer I picked up off the road, uh, which roadkill deer, do it. I don't care if it's legal or not. No one's going to actually do anything about it. Get those if they're in good shape. And uh, we did that and we're like, never, maybe a pound or two, like, you know, off the cuff, we'll use it for, but never, ever, never, ever, never, ever, ever will I make 20 pounds of sausage out of a, a machine like that ever again. So most of my sausages I do loose, you know, and I do patties or I do for flavorings and cooking and other things. And um, I'm not going to go through it because we need to move on, but uh, I actually have a pretty good um, recipe for Mexican style chorizo. Yeah. And you will never buy those little tubes of nasty crap in the freezer <laughs> section again. If you make fresh chorizo sausage. Well, you just explained hundred percent why I never do sausages in tubes. Okay. The same reason. I was like, I'm just going to do patties. I'm good with patties. If you want it in a link form, just roll yeah, it. Make rolls. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's fine. What do you got for, you got bacon on your list. What about bacon? Okay. So I don't know how you make bacon. Uh, because we raise pork here, I, I get bellies. And what I've, so I tried wet brining versus dry brining. Um, and I've, I've ended up here. I, I like to cut it into about, I guess that's about five pounds or less pieces. So I've done the whole belly once. That was a terrible mistake. <laughs> I ended up with overly salted at the same ratio, but over, overly salted bacon. So what I'll do is I'll take it a, a, a four to five pound piece and I, I weigh it. And then I use an online calculator to figure out the salt to pink salt ratio, because I will use the curing salt on, on, on the bacon. It, it does, it changes the consistency of the meat a little bit so that when I slice it, it stays, it doesn't get as like flaky as if I don't use it. So I do like that. And then to that, I add a little teeny bit of brown sugar. I didn't use to add sugar because I'm an anti-sugar person. I just don't, I mean, unless I'm having a piece of chocolate, I don't add sugar to things. But that cuts the edge off the salt a little bit. And then the spices I'll add are rosemary, garlic, um, and sage again. And then I usually will add something like a celery salt or, or something of that nature. If I don't have it, it'll be cilantro. If I don't have that, it'll be coriander or something of, of, of that flavor profile. And then what's the last thing? Ah, black pepper. Black pepper or white pepper. White pepper is a little bit... Um, spicier and i do like the white pepper so what i do is i take the spices i mix it with all of that salt and then i'll crust it around that piece of bacon and then i vacuum seal it throw it in the fridge for about for six to 14 days and then i'll um if i don't feel like slicing it or smoking it i'll just put it in the freezer from there but usually what I do is then I'll take it out, rinse all of that off, and then cold smoke it for two to four hours in my cold smoker. And my cold smoker, guys, is nothing fancy. I have a one of those grills with the spout that comes out, you know, the smokers. And there is a dryer tube from that into a spout that goes into a file cabinet I have. And I have racks in the file cabinet. And what happens is the smoke is hot when it comes out, cools down in that long metal dryer tube, and then it cold smokes. I like to cold smoke on a really cold day. Like if it's a 20 degree day in December, I'll have a cold smoke temperature 
uh, close to the freezing level in that. Um, I cold smoke it for four hours, slice it and freeze it, or just freeze it and slice it when I come out. And that turns out really, really good. I'll just add with cold smoking, what I've been doing for cold smoking a lot lately. So I just use a pellet tube. Okay. Just use a pellet tube. And there's a little heat, but it's not enough to really matter. And I'm, I'm actually thinking about building a dedicated something for cold smoking, basically like a just a cheap metal cabinet and throw yeah. two tubes in the bottom. Because one, you know, the bigger tubes, if you fill them, they'll give you eight hours of smoke for about like, I don't know, 70 cents worth of pellets. Mm -hmm. So it's... It's super easy. Uh, I'm doing pork uh, carnitas for one of our breakfasts this year at the workshop. And those were done on the grill, but they were also done with a pellet tube smoker. So I put like, I have a huge grill, as you know, yeah. I have like the biggest grill Weber makes. And you put the two side burners on and then you're not anywhere near the meat. You're in direct at the lowest temperature, smoker tube in the back and throw the pork shoulders. I can fit two pork shoulders in one of those big aluminum throwaway pans because then you can throw it away. And threw them in there, and I run those for like about eight hours. And oh my god, yeah. And so, smoker tubes is another way that you guys can expand things. And you again, since it's not really hot, you can cold smoke cheese, folks. And uh, that's something we really can't dig deep into today. But I'll give yeah. you the thing for smoking cheese: do it for two hours at the most, then take the cheese, vacuum seal it, leave it alone, throw it in the refrigerator for like a week then open it up and then slice into it and eat it. If you smoke cheese and eat it right away, it tastes like ass. I just, there's no way around it. It's just awful. It's not good. And it's something about when it sits for a while, like that it settles in or something and then it's delicious. Yeah. So. And if you have, if you have a big grill like you have and don't have a smoker tube, you can just put some wood chips in a cast iron skillet with a little bit yep. of water. You can do that. And that'll work too. I've done that with hams before I had the, uh, the filing cabinet set up that I have now. I, yeah, I, that's how I did that. Joe's saying old school lockers, like school lockers and all but that would work right. You got the little yeah. vent in the front. I'm sure you could come up with something at a swap meet or a flea market or something like that pretty easily. Um, what else? I think that's about it. We've got, I, I don't want to hold you too long. Cause I know you got another live feed today. Um, and no. uh, so do you want to tell people how they can see you? Because I'm, I'm piking out today. I'm not going to be there. I know. that's not, It's not your week to be there. It's not my week. Oh, well, if people are interested in... Well, first of all, I'm on the expert council. If you have questions about how to preserve or recipes or cooking or any of those sorts of things, I'm happy to take those questions. I've, I've spent a lot of time thinking about how not to poison yourself by preserving food and things of that nature. And it's a lot of people are a lot more scared on that topic than they need to be. Most, the whole purpose, the whole reason these food preservation methods exist is because they haven't killed people. So they've been passed on, right? If so they killed people, your grandmother would have killed your dad and you wouldn't be here. Exactly. <laughs> so, so it's, it's something that it, you can be fearless about this and you can go for it. And the worst negative result you're going to have most likely if you're actually you know, following the directions is that you failed and something went bad and it smells bad. Um, so, so that's my first thing. Second, if, so get questions into the expert council, just send those to Jack. And then if you want to just hear more about homesteading, small business, entrepreneurship, those sorts of things, I have a podcast. It's called living free in Tennessee, living free in Tennessee.com. It's not just about Tennessee, but I live in Tennessee and it rhymes. So that's that's a way you can follow me. I am with Jack on Unloose the Goose at UnlooseTheGoose.com. And then I guess the big thing I wanted to talk about, Jack, was the Self-Reliance Festival. All right. Well, let's you know hear what it. that is? No. So you know who John Willis is, right? Yes. I, oh, that. Yes, I do know. Go ahead. So he's at Special Operations Equipment in Camden, Tennessee. And I've started doing coffee for him. So if you buy coffee from John Willis, it's made by Holler Roast. And... He was like, hey, I do these open houses. Let's do something a little bit bigger. And so we came up with this idea on October 23rd from 10 in the morning till four at night. We're going to do what's called the Self-Reliance Festival. And rather than have like big name speakers, although we do have some now, I thought, well, let's just put it out to the network and you apply and you tell me what you'd like to demo that will increase somebody's self-reliance. So we have a welding demo, small engine maintenance, cheese making, knife throwing, how to assess your property for security, just a bunch of different demos from the same people who will be at this. It's 30 bucks in Camden, Tennessee. And that's at livingfreeintennessee.com forward slash 
self-reliance festival. It's going to be really fun. And then after that, there's going to be a bonfire, I think, but there's going to be a party. So people will hang out into the evening. I'm really excited to do this because we're taking two networks and, and sort of overlapping them. There's been some overlap, but I think now more than ever, we need to be committed to strengthening our in-person relationships just to increase our stability. And, and an event like this or Jack's workshop or any of those things is a great way to do that. Well, let me throw a shout out for John too. Um, when I, when I just had started out and I mean, just started, I was in my car. I had like 500 listeners. I was nothing yet. John found my show somehow started listening to me. He made the people that work for him, listen to it every day. Mm -hmm. He sent me all types of gear. He was very good to me. And you know, he was a part of my initial success. He's a good dude. And I can't buy anything from him. He won't let me. If I order shit, he like sends it to me and refunds my money. Yeah. Um, he's just a great guy. And that, you know, he's the source you of are the wearing shirt, a shirt. <laughs> right? Yeah. So if you want to get a gulag short shirt where the A is the, uh, I'm all backwards in the thing now, yeah. where the A is the combat cock, get on over to original SOE gear and pick up one of those shirts. And I bet you'd be able to get them at that festival too. Because John does not hate money. John That's another thing I like money. about John. He does not hate money. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, uh, the other stuff, like tell people how to find you. and Yeah, and so livingfreeintennessee.com. If you love awesome premium fresh roasted coffee, hollowroast.com for your coffee. And there's a membership discount. All of that, you know, once you get to my website, you can find the other things because there are hot links to that. And like we said, if you want to ask Nicole questions to be on the TSP, um, just send me an email, jack at the survival podcast.com, TSPC expert in the subject line. And then say, this question is for expert panel member, Nicole Sauce. And then give us your question in one sentence, one sentence. Then you can give us all the details you want. If you want me to read it, hit return before you start doing details. Cause I have to scan my mail like that. But that way, when I send it to Nicole, she won't be like, well, I, I, what question is there here? One question per email and be specific with it. Then give us details and she'll get you an answer or any of our other experts will get you an answer. Uh, Nicole, thanks for being with us today. Sorry for the technical gremlins. Based on what happened after I faded and came back, I'm pretty sure it was my fault. Um, so I guess that's good because at least it went away. I'm glad it went away. Thanks for having <laughs> me on the show, Jack. It's always great to be here.